It's great to be here in San Marino Community Church. I actually used to live nearby. And so right after we got married 20 years ago, my wife and I moved to Pasadena. And uh, almost 17 years ago, my eldest son was born in Huntington, which is just a 10-minute drive from here. So it's really great to be here. And it's really weird to be back because we left in 2008 uh, went up the five, 950 miles to Portland, Oregon, and I'm still at this institution. And driving around, uh, I guess my question is mainly for the Asians here. What happened to this area? It got so Asian <laughs> since 2008. <laughs> so I remember Santa Anita Mall used to be like Ann Taylor, hot dog on a stick, <laughs> baby gap. I look today, and it's like Uniglo and Muji and Din Tai Fung are in Santa Anita Mall. And I'm wondering, is this some sort of like Lunar New Year special? Maybe they're back to Ann Taylor today if I go back. Uh, it's so bizarre to be back in this area. Like, it, we were always kind of Asian in the San Gabriel Valley, but we have like fully colonized this area. <laughs> it was, it's, uh, it's, really, it's really weird. Um, I, uh, I still call it the five. It annoys all the Oregonians, but I still hold on to that proper, you know, proper noun before the freeway. So I call it the five. Uh, and it's always so good to be back in Southern California. The weird thing is uh, yesterday there's like a one degree differential between Southern California and Portland, Oregon. It was almost the same temperature in terms of a high. The other weird thing is I just haven't seen the sun since like July, so it's been <laughs> awesome to be around here. The joke is you know, the rainy season in Oregon is only from you know, August 1st to July 30th. Otherwise, it's pretty nice. That's the only rainy season. Uh, I'm going to read to you from Nehemiah, but I first want to explain to you I'm actually spending about 10 years of my professional life researching the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. So I finished a book last fall. Uh, I also am working on a second commentary. It's due in about four years. And uh, that's where I met Pastor Jessica, where um, I was invited to go to Princeton to talk about Ezra and Nehemiah for, for one week in front of a bunch of pastors. And I want to share a little bit of why I, I did that, what I like about this book. And so uh, in 2014, I left my position for a year-long sabbatical, and I took my family to Seoul, Korea. And I'm a second-generation Korean-American born in the States, uh, but, but I went back as an adult. I pastored there, and so I speak Korean pretty well. And in 2014, I went back with my wife, who's also Korean-American, and my two boys, who are third generation, the, one of them born in Huntington, one of them born in Cedar sinai And uh, we went in 2014, and I remember thinking, you know, uh, I think my mom and dad came in 67. So I called my mom just to confirm. Mom, you came in 67, right? You and dad came. Like, yeah, it's 1967. Well, Korea back then, as some of you might know, it's nothing like it is today. It was one of the poorest economies. Uh, the GDP was similar to a lot of landlocked African countries at the time. I remember the first time I went to my grandmother's house in the late 70s in Seoul, in the biggest city, there was actually no running water. There was a pump that you had to get, and you had to boil the water before, before you used it. And now it is the 11th largest GDP and it's so amazing how much that land has changed since 1967 to 2014. And uh, what was so striking to me is that uh, Judah was exiled in 539 BC, or in I'm sorry, 586 BC, and they came back in 539, so a 47 year difference. My mom and dad left Korea in 1967, and I came back with my third generation children in 2014, another 47 year difference. And one thing happened our very first summer in Korea. So summer is also like massively humid and hot. Like you're just covered in sweat all the time. And so uh, we send our second year old or our second kid, he's six years old, to play soccer. He's playing soccer with the neighborhood boys and he looks fully Korean, right? And his, his accent is actually pretty clean. He um, didn't speak English till he was four. And so he's playing with the other boys and he comes back to the apartment and he's covered in sweat. And he asks me, uh, Dad, am I Korean or am I American? There was something, even though he looked fully Korean, there's something about his identity which was a little off from the other Korean kids. And there was an identity, even at the age of six, he understood that 
maybe he's not fully Korean, but he's not really fully American either. And so he asked that question. And so that got me thinking about Ezra Nehemiah, about living in a land where you had been, and then you left, and then you come back after a long period of time. So even in the 12 years since I've been away from Southern California, this area has changed, and I've changed. I've changed as well. And so Ezra and Nehemiah enters this type of setting. So I'd like to ask you, if you have your Bibles, let's go ahead and turn to Nehemiah 8, verses 1 through 8. So one thing about Ezra and Nehemiah, they're really considered one book, and they go there for two reasons. They want to build the temple and build the wall. And by Nehemiah 8, they've actually finished those things. And so what happens after they finish their assigned tasks in Nehemiah 8.1? All the people gather together into the square before the water gate. They took the scribe Ezra to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had given to Israel. Accordingly, the priest Ezra brought the law before the assembly, both men and women, and all who could hear with understanding. This was on the first day of the seventh month. He read, it from the, he read from it facing the square before the water gate from early morning until midday in the presence of the men and the women who could understand and the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. The scribe Ezra stood on a wooden platform that had been made for the purpose and beside him stood Mattitiah, Shema, Ananiah, Uriah, Hilkiah, and Messiah on the right hand and Padiah, Mishael, Mikajah, Hajan, Hashbadana, Zechariah, Meshalem on the left. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for it was standing above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. Then Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands. Then they bowed their heads and worshiped the God with their faces to the ground. Also Jeshua, Benai, Sherebiah, Jamim, Akub, Shabbatai, Hodiah, Messiah, Kelita, Azariah, Josabad, Hanan, Peliah, the Levites helped the people to understand the law while the people remained in their places. So they read from the book, from the law of God, with interpretation, they gave sense so that the people understood the reading. I'm sorry about those weird names. I'm trying, trying not to show off. Uh, so as I study Ezra and Nehemiah, like, as I said, you should have ended the book already. They came to build the temple and to build the wall, and they did all those things despite troubles. And you probably should have ended at Nehemiah 7. And then Nehemiah 8 starts something new. They assemble the people, and they read the Torah. So it's in this context where you get this kind of different style of leadership that emerges, which is probably not what you think. I look at kind of, you know, as a good biblical scholar, I Google Ezra Nehemiah, I see what people are writing, I see what people are preaching, and it's often centered on leadership. And as a good professor, I will say that is not wrong, but I don't think that's the only answer. I actually don't think that's the central answer. I think uh, it is a peripheral part of Ezra Nehemiah. It presents ideas of leadership, but leadership is attached to your identity, and your identity is centered as one who worships the Lord. So leadership looks different in the Bible than it does in other places. So two things I'd like to leave with you today in terms of leadership. The first thing is leadership is Torah-centered. So here it says the law, Torah, but what does Torah really mean? It actually just means teaching. It's centered on the teaching of God. And here in Nehemiah 8 is one of the very rare times of the Bible where Torah refers to actual physical document, an actual book probably a codex, a, a collection of um, papers, papyrus or sheepskin or vellum or something like that where they writ, wrote the law. And one thing you should note that Ezra was a scribe and he was a scribe in an area where probably 3% of the people were literate, 3%. And not only was he literate, he was the most literate, the most educated. And the interesting thing is, uh, have you been around people that are a little bit overly educated, you know, and kind of, they kind of make, it's like CrossFit, they make sure you know that they are overly educated. I don't CrossFit. Um, probably overly educated. Uh, so 
uh, but Ezra put himself down and lifted up the teaching of God himself. And so what he did is he didn't even preach. He just read from the Torah and he read for six hours. The longest I've ever preached ever. Uh, and I've been preaching since 1994, probably 35 minutes, longest ever. Shortest, probably 35 seconds, because I used to be a youth pastor, and that's kind of the limit right there. <laughs> 35 seconds. Uh, he spoke and read for six hours, and they paid attention. Now, how did that happen? Well, I want you to imagine not being literate. And not only are you not literate, you do not have access to the teachings of God. You don't have access to the Bible. But you're trying to do life and worship for weeks and for years. Then suddenly, you have the book of the law of Moses. You have the Torah. And how attentive would you be if you've never heard the word of God, but your grandparents have heard it and they've talked about it before. So that's the hunger and thirst they have for God's word in this setting. And that's how they can listen for six hours. And they also listen together in community. They listen together. And so I have one exercise when I teach Bible to undergrads. And what we do, I take away their actual physical Bibles, and we listen to the Gospel of Mark from start to finish. And it's about two hours and 40 minutes. And, and so it's something they do differently because they do it all together. And they talk about it. And so two things undergrads think when they listen to the entire Gospel of Mark is one, Jesus is a lot more angry than they ever pictured him. He's a lot more angry. And two, the way you read it makes a big difference. Uh, this is from uh, a Bible project uh, called Voices where they actual hired, um, I'm not joking, you can download and buy this yourself, uh, Samuel L. Jackson plays God. Uh, it's filled with African-American actors and actresses that read, and, and it is interpretive the way you read and they did it as a community. How attentive would you be? So I will confess, I totally love TV. I watch a ton of TV almost every night, you know, and I will say the Koreans invented binge watching. Long before streaming services, we would go to the Korean store and get these grocery bags filled with VHS tapes, and we would just watch, 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 and start a series when the series was done. And so, what great Game of Thrones, Breaking Bad, uh, you know, Stranger Things, when you're watching that next episode, the hunger that you have when a new episode comes out, that's kind of what you're thinking right here. They knew of the word of God, but they never had a chance to listen to it. And look at what they do. They're attentive to the book of the law. They stand up in verse five. They respond, amen, amen, lift their hands. They, they bow their heads, they worship. So their body is making some sort of response to the word of God. And they understood. And so at this time, um, people may be losing their ability to speak Hebrew. And we know that from Nehemiah 13. And so you have this challenge. How do you speak the word of God? How do you read this when people are losing their ability to, to speak Hebrew? And any, any immigrant community can tell you this is a real struggle. So both my kids were born here in Southern California. My older one left when he was five. Uh, we sent him to a Korean daycare, and so he actually didn't learn English till he was four, even though he was raised in L.A. And my second one, my wife was at home. We spoke to him in Korean. He actually also didn't live, learn English until he was four. And so my older one was five. We moved to Oregon. We sent him to the public kindergarten. Within one month, his preferred language switched from Korean to English. And I don't blame the kid, because no one else spoke Korean in class. He changed his life. So what do you do with a community that has different languages? Well, it says that they interpreted, they explained. And what that probably means is they read the book of the law in Hebrew, but then they also probably translate it into Aramaic. So everybody would have access to the book of the law. And this is the first lesson of leadership. We knew that Ezra was a strong, uh, educated leader, but he deferred himself to the word of God, to the teachings of the Lord. And that's a lesson of leadership. It is Torah-centered. It is not centered on an individual. The second le lesson of leadership is it belongs to the community. And so we actually have data of publicly traded companies, 
look at the Fortune 500, and the leaders, the CEOs of these companies tend to share certain physical traits. They tend to be male, overwhelmingly so. They tend to be Caucasian. They tend to be actually very tall. And there are two ways to go about it. They're either bald or they have a great haircut. There's no in-between. They either lop it all off or they have a great haircut. Uh, 16 of these Fortune 500 companies actually release demographics on their executive leaders. And you know from them, it's a similar thing. 80% of these vice presidents, the senior managers of Fortune 500 companies are male. 72% are Caucasian. And uh, this is what we see in the demographics of large publicly traded institutions. Uh, but we often see, this, see the same for university leaders, for political leaders, law firm partners, hospital presidents. Before we alert our outrage for this, how different is the church? The church is probably pretty similar as well. There are 170 Christian university presidents in North America right now, 170. Of those 170, they're overwhelmingly male presidents. And of those 170, 169 are actually Caucasian. Of those 170 positions. So what do we know from Ezra? We know that leadership doesn't belong with the individual on top. Leadership belongs with the community. So verse two, accordingly, the priest Ezra brought the law before the assembly, both men and women and all who could hear with understanding. In the presence of men and women. That is an amazing verse because in the Hebrew language, which this is written in, men actually means men and women. But Ezra chose to be redundant. The book chooses to be redundant by saying men and women. This is a fiercely inclusive note. And throughout church history, we understand that in literary terms, men equals men and women in most cases. So all our heroes of church history, Augustine and Anselm and Calvin, they write about men, but we assume men and women. But here, uh, this explicit descriptor of men and women I think is a, a deliberate step that leadership is inclusive for everyone, regardless of gender. Also, leadership is inclusive of all who had ears to understand. You know what that means? It means that children were fully a part of the leadership community because they, ha they had ears to hear and understand. Leadership belongs to the community. This is a fitting application here in 2020. Because as you think about how this community of faith move, moves forward, the decisions and the leadership is not restricted to the few, but to all men and to all women, to all genders. It isn't restricted to age. So I, like, I totally want to retire in, in Asia. I want to retire in, in Korea because age is actually pretty cool in Korea. And the healthcare is good too. There's that, I guess. But uh, you know, you use different language. It's, it's an um, honorific language. So I speak differently to... Uh, elders than I do to people at the same. There, there's something great about age in Korea. It's honored. And uh, here, sometimes it's actually different that you're penalized for being older. Leadership is inclusive of gender. It's inclusive of age, ethnicity, class, the way that your body is able to do things. Leadership belongs to all of these people. And this is the leadership model in, in the MI8, Torah-centered and inclusive of all. Notice the settings in the MI8. In verse 1, they gather by the water gate. This is a public place with no restricted access. Anyone can be there and everyone does go through there. In verse 5, Ezra opened the book inside of all the people, for he was standing above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. So one thing to note about the Bible, it's very laconic. It doesn't give a lot of detail when it doesn't need to. So God created the heavens and the earth, boom, done. And that's it. That's all it says. We don't know anything else. Uh, but here it's overly redundant because I think there's an emphasis on the inclusivity of leadership. In verse 6, then Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, amen, amen, lifting up their hands. So the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, it is so fiercely Torah-centered. It is so fiercely inclusive of all the community. And what strikes me is this is a context of social displacement. 
Just like I said, I came back to Korea after 47 years. The Judeans came back to Jerusalem after 47 years. But it is the, anal the analogy breaks down. Jerusalem was devastated. It was poor. It was still reeling in the destruction of the Babylonians. I want you to remember and think about like New York City if we didn't clean up the rubble from 9-11. That was the reminder. It was a group of a repatriation in the midst of a gigantic empire. So how did they find themselves? They sought who they were, and they modeled leadership on their identity as the people of God. And so uh, back to my six-year-old. He is um, covered in sweat. Uh, he's now 11. He is uh, taller than my wife at 5'3", so he's a tall 11, which is bizarre because I'm not tall. My wife isn't tall. Uh, he has um, big feet, <laughs> bigger than 5'3", and it's hard to even think about this kid who was born here, but back at six-year-old, like, am I Korean or am I American? And back then, those of you with younger children, whenever a six-year-old asks you a kind of serious question, you, you need to take advantage of that moment. You know, you need to develop some strategy, some routine. And so I have a routine when my six-year-old asks me something kind of big. I get down to his level and grab his hand and look him in the eye. And I said, I don't know. Ask your mom. I have no idea. <laughs> I, that's, that's a big question, and I'm not sure what the answer is. And I actually, I did that. And, uh, and so he goes to my wife and asks, Mom, am I... Korean or am I American? And she does that thing, you know, that moms do. She uh, goes, what do you think? What do you think? And my second one goes, well, I, I think I'm Korean and American. And she says, you're right. You are correct. We are people that are also displaced in certain arenas. We're called strangers and aliens. We are people with allegiance, despite which we wholly hold on to our ethnicity. I'm fully Korean. But as God has called me, God has called me to be a part of his community. Even though I meet almost all of you today for the first time, I can worship with you. I could sing these songs. And I could express even my thought as you played that song. I remember that song. It was, it was kind of a big one when I was here before 2008. And think about, I'm at the place near where my first son was born, where I became a father, and God has been good to me. And I could share that with you, even though I meet you today. Your identity is in God, the one who has called you. And your leadership and your responsibility in that identity is to be a part of this, a deep part of this community, to center your worship and your leadership on Torah, and to make sure that this worship is deeply inclusive. Let's pray together. Dear God, we are grateful for your word. We're grateful that we live in an era where we have access to your word. Forgiveness for the ways that we have neglected who you are. We have neglected your study. Give us the grace and courage to look forward to leading the world, leading this community in true, authentic worship of you. We're grateful that you called us despite our, our shortcomings. We're grateful that you call us to nothing more than what we can handle. We're grateful for your gift of Holy Spirit that strengthens us as we serve you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.